Our next speaker is Edward Cook, Charles F. Montgomery Professor of the History of Art and Director of the Center for, of Study in American Decorative Arts and Material Culture, as well as Professor of American Studies. Professor Cook focuses upon American material culture and decorative arts. His books include Making Furniture in Pre-Industrial America, The Social Economy of Newtown and Woodbury, Connecticut, and Inventing Boston, Design, Production, and Consumption in the Atlantic World, 1680 to 1720, both of which focus upon the context of craftsman-client relations in colonial North America. He's also written extensively on modern craft, historicizing and explicating more recent forms of production and has been co-curator and publication author of six different exhibitions. He is currently writing Global Objects Towards a Connecticut Connected sorry, Art History. Cook's work in expanding the field of decorative arts has led to several awards, including the Iris Foundation Award for Outstanding Contribution to the Decorative Arts, the Furniture Society's Award of Distinction, election as an honorary fellow of the American Craft Council, and College Art Association's Distinguished Teacher of Art History Award. Please welcome Professor Cook. Thanks so much, Matthew. It's, um, it's really nice to be participating in this idea of interdisciplinary humanities to reassert the fact that humanities is not a dead um, kind of topic in, a, in an age of uh, big data and, um, and different kinds of STEM, but actually thinking, can we look at humanities in a expanded field in some ways? And in some, um, when I have started to get into sort of dealing with objects within an art history department, which used to be considered the minor arts in the old slide library, um, how do you make them part of the real center uh, of a discipline like art history? Um, and one of the moves that I felt like was really essential is traditional art history has been very ocular central. Um, that is, it's all about the eye, the eye and the mind, and it's visual um, analysis. And sometimes you might describe it as being object-centered. Um, some would even say object uh, or maybe art-obsessed, uh, work of art-obsessed. And I wanted to flip that a little bit and talk about um, object-driven uh, kinds of inquiry. In other words, think about objects from the inside out rather than the outside in, um, and sometimes not even thinking about the in of just sort of staying on the surface. And so part of what I've been about, particularly within the last 10 years, is developing a sense of what I call material literacy or maybe material intelligence. Um, that is knowledge of materials and techniques and how those can lead to new and innovative questions. And I think of this not as a substitute for digital humanities, but actually it's complementary in terms of how we might open up um, the idea of humanities into a broader sensibility. So one of the things that's really key is, that, um, again, sort of thinking about the stability of materials and, um, and techniques versus the permeability, there's so many possibilities of materials, techniques, and it, what really leads to this idea that I've developed in this new book about interconnected art history. Um, it's not a linear path from A to B, but actually it's got multiple layers, directions that are layered up on top of one another to create this kind of rich uh, mix. So how do you go about teaching from the inside out um, in some respects? And part of um, this, um, and Sue Walker knows this uh, well in terms of my interest in asking questions of materials. That is, I was always struck by people when I was doing my graduate work who would just simply stay true to ideas of style terms. Um, and to me, I always had questions. You know, why did somebody over-theorize the carving of a panel in the Dedham Medfield chess? and talked about the use of these compasses to lay out all these different lines. And I decided to do a carving exercise, having never done something like this, and realized a compass is used in four different areas, but that's it. The rest of it is guided by the, the curve of the carving gouge. If you had the right four tools, I could carve that in 20 minutes. Light bulb goes off. They over-theorize it without understanding sort of from the inside out. And so I did a number of... Uh, projects while I was writing my dissertation um, that I was asking questions that had come up 
in uh, what I was studying, what I was writing about. So a great way to actually write a dissertation, um, making things at the same time. It then continued on um, as I tried to acquire, um, not that I was going to be become a full-time maker. Um, I had no illusions uh, of this whatsoever. But could I expose myself to trying different things? So doing a, a, a turning residency down in Pennsylvania for a week, um, working with um, these international uh, turning stars from France, from Australia, from the United States, learning some basics, being able to make a series of objects with each of them, sort of spending a day with each of these um, international residents um, and sort of working within their vein, uh, if you will, and realizing, contrary to most, what most people thought, a lathe is not an industrial tool that predetermines the result. It's merely a tool, um, and you can use it in multiple ways. I follow that trying glass blowing, trying block printing. Anywhere, everywhere I go and visit makers throughout the world, I'll try my hand at something. I'll try hammering copper in Pune. Um, and what you end up, I mean, here, sort of like learning to work on the ground and learning to use your feet, using other parts of your body as a way of biomechanic feedback and how that affects the work, posture, um, and counters kind of a, uh, a Western perspective on serious work, you stand at a bench and you sort of are upright the whole time um, and you sort of over jig some of your tools. Um, here, you know, working on the ground, there are many different advantages for certain types of work. So it's this kind of exploration that was so key that I then wanted to take into the classroom. And one of the things that's really uh, such a strength of teaching any kind of art history at Yale, obviously, is collections. And it's not just the museums themselves and what's on view, but it's also what's in storage. It's the um, conservation department, uh, the scientific research department of IPCH. These are all ways of thinking about objects from the inside out. And so when I teach classes, what I'm oftentimes trying to do is say, yes, visual analysis is important, but so is touch. So it's feeling the heft of something, feeling surface, being able to turn something upside down, look inside it. Um, and so a lot of my courses, with the help of colleagues at the art gallery, have been, I don't know any other uh, university museum that museums that dedicate so much space to study rooms in which you can bring objects off of you and you can handle things, you can pass them around. Um, many different, uh, I've, I've been to, uh, different gatherings and the Mellon Foundation has funded in terms of trying to get museum people and academics together. And there's some people who feel so excited that they pass objects around in trays. No touching, but just passing around in tray and think that's education. What it is, it's fear of objects um, in some respects. And what's wonderful is the way in which colleagues here work with you to establish the right parameters to make this a safe endeavor, to make sure that Students are trained, teaching fellows are trained in how to handle objects, how to model good behavior with objects, so that the students actually become the most respectful um, kinds of uh, users of the collection. They understand responsibility if you tell them about it, you give it to them, you model it uh, for them. So this is just sort of um, what I do is I teach teaching fellows how to teach with objects rather than in, in front of them, which I think is another really important kind of maneuver and then they go ahead um, and teach their students. So what you're doing is you're having an effect on two different generations of, um, of scholars, but the graduate students learning how to teach with objects as well as the undergraduate exposure to the kinds of questions they could ask of um, objects in terms of this kind of global perspective. And so here's a, you can tell it's mask time from 2021, um, and we are back in the classroom teaching. Um, this was the hardest thing to, of course, to teach object-driven inquiry remotely. We tried to get around it, but there's nothing like um, the satisfaction. And the students, you could tell, not only were they happy to be back in the classroom together, but they also liked being around objects uh, yet again. There are wonderful resources, not simply um, in central campus, but west campus becomes this uh, wonderful area where you've got collection study centers, um, 
The whole furniture study, which used to be on York Street, um, is out there and becomes this incredible lab that's basically open stack storage, if you want to use a library term, that you can browse, that I actually run a, uh, a first year seminar to get somebody early on in their career and get people who are engineers, who are art uh, majors, who might be history majors, um, a, a, quite a swath of people who might take this course. And we meet, that's the classroom, the furniture study. We go out in the shuttle every week, one o'clock shuttle. We're out there for two hours. I can run class on the shuttle. As it, Roxana was nice to get a dedicated shuttle so I could actually have Q&A and some other kind of housekeeping uh, on the way out. And then also being able to teach graduate seminars um, that would oftentimes uh, involve handling, looking, talking about objects um, with them right with us, not just looking at images. The Wordle Study Center, where a lot of the collections of non-furniture materials um, from American uh, decorative arts, um, ceramics, glass, textiles, et cetera. It's an amazing, again, open storage, but unlike the Loose Center uh, at the Met, which is just encased in captivity uh, in Plexi, this is all you can call things and bring them out for a particular class. So with Denise Leidy, who's the curator of Asian art, we ran a, a joint class on, um, on lacquer in a global context, not just East Asian lacquer, but also Japaning from Europe and America um, to talk about uh, a, uh, you know, non bond uh, export wear from Japan. But handling things, looking at things, ask, asking questions of the objects as we looked inside of them was a critical part of it. I've also tried to sort of follow the principles of John Dewey, learning by doing. Um, and what I try to do is sort of put making exercises into various different uh, courses. Initially, in the old furniture study, they had sort of a, a shop, and I would bring in um, a friend of mine, Peter Follinsby, who used to be the joiner at Plymouth Plantation, an open-air museum up in Massachusetts. And we worked out sort of different exercises we could do within two hours to give students a chance to split out green wood to plane it to learn how to do some preliminary carving. Not to make something in its entirety, but just get a few principles. This is something that I've then carried forward as another part of West Campus. Uh, Scott Strobel, when he was head of West Campus, gave me a, a space out there um, to use as a low-tech maker space that I could store some tools, some materials out there. And I've started to incorporate this. So that's where I've done uh, woodworking now uh, on the left for uh, first year seminar in 2019. I had another one uh, class on vessels uh, in which we um, one uh, class, we ended up hammering copper discs into bowls to learn something about um, hammering uh, the malleability of metal. This is, um, again, sort of a green woodworking I did for this um, material literacy and then uh, embodied artisanal knowledge using just basic tools like clubs, froze, uh, hatchets, uh, and knives, and sending people to work the advantage of fall in New England, um, you can work outside. Um, so one year we were carving spoons uh, on West Campus around the fire pit. Um, it wasn't available this year. So we went to one of the courtyards of West Campus and the collection study center um, with a shaving horse, again, hatchets, froze, splitting out wood, um, green, moist wood, and then uh, working on different spatulas and, uh, and the like. All this is working closely with different kinds of artisans. Um, so Peter Follinsby, um, Andres Garces was, were helpful with the wood. Joan Parcher, a metalsmith up in Providence. I worked with her to developing a very basic kit of tools that I could give students to work with, um, making copper discs, learning how to shape something with a ball-peen hammer um, on, a, uh, on a steel block. I worked with Andrew Hamilton, um, developing uh, another uh, session on spinning and fiber um, and watching students get frustrated trying to use a drop spindle. Um, you know, these very basic uh, sorts of endeavors, but you learn so much about the materials and the feedback on them that you can just see um, the ways in which when you have them, uh, students in class, the way they get absorbed, time flies um, for them. 
I've also sent out kits, ceramic kits, metal kits, um, and weaving kits to students for the undergraduate class that they do in their own dorms. This was a COVID-related uh, sort of endeavor. And again, students just raved about do learning off screen and being able to sort of learn so much and then apply what they've learned in the grappling with the material to their own work. Again, with Andrew, we did some weaving. This is some of the uh, cardboard loom weaving um, we did for the undergraduate, just providing them with uh, cotton warp, uh, thread warp, uh, cardboard that sets up at the loom, and then a series of acrylics that are sort of wool-like. Um, so this is two different students' work um, just completed this year. I've worked with Mark Potter to work on sort of uh, different sorts of uh, recipes for clay um, that you, know, you can add different elements to it. You can create different sorts of appearances. We did this uh, exercise in which we gave students an hour in which they worked with uh, prescribed uh, proportion recipes to make something. And then we gave them unlimited materials and had them measure out. And these were the measuring devices they had, just a piece of wood with holes drilled in it. So they had to work out proportions in their minds of what these materials were going to do. This is the kit of tools we used to then work with either regular clay mixed or we could start add in different kinds of ingredients that they made their own recipe. Once they made them, we made them make test strips to see, you know, here are these different uh, formulas. When they fired, some of them didn't do so well. They shrunk, they bent around. Some of them were not very stable and some of them were disasters. Um, I feel like some of the students didn't know when you when you're baking, for instance, you do dry ingredients first and then add liquid. There were some people who did liquid first and just peeled all the, we were working on sheetrock and it just like made a mess on the boards that they were working on. You learn a lot along the way. And then these were just some of the objects. I had everybody do a test strip in an object with a given formula that they had to mix and then also with their own invention. What I've done recently for the undergraduates is working with Penelope um, von Grinsven, who's um, taken on responsibility of the five undergraduate uh, pottery studios, is to develop a kit that you could coil. And this um, sort of has a folding board with canvas, a cutting wire, uh, two and a half pounds, three pounds of clay, a bucket with a sponge, you know, um, sort of a, a needle tool, a rib, everything you need to make objects like this. These are not thrown on a wheel. These are all coiled or slab construction. These are undergraduates this past fall, um, this semester, who are making these sorts of things with this kind of exercise, just given clay, a banding wheel to sort of like a lazy Susan, just to get some sort of sense of uh, what's possible. So, you know, in teaching material literacy, Yale's got this incredible opportunity um, in terms of access to collections, things that will inspire you, um, ways to then try out making yourself exposed to different sorts of materials, and then also taking that knowledge back to the classroom, looking, handling at objects, not simply looking at them under a vitrine. And it's just a, a couple things that are important to this idea of the pedagogy of teaching object-driven inquiry. Um, is in addition to having object study classrooms in abundance, and it's wonderful to see the Peabody with their renovations doing the same thing, but to uh, also start to realize, well, if you can have a messy space, can you design, um, can you sort of work with sympathetic, knowledgeable makers? Nobody, one person can do it all. So oftentimes it's a collaboration, um, like to and froing with Joan Parcher, what would be a good exercise? What I tried the first time didn't work. Um, and that's when I got her into the conversation. These are things that, you know, I was never trained in it, but it's wonderful to sort of develop these ideas together. And then I think the other thing that's important is thinking about time um, in terms of what's, what can you accomplish within two hours? What's a project? And so many Yale students are perfectionists who have an idea of what they want to make, and you have to get them to shift that aside and think, just go with a process. Don't worry about what you want to exert your will on something, what can you learn uh, along the way? So it's been a fabulous kind of um, path to, to go down to thinking about the material humanities uh, in some respects and to thinking about 
what Yale really allows us to do. Um, and I hope that you get a chance to sort of visit with some of the other information tables from um, the, um, you know, just thinking of the Wordle Center and the Art Gallery Study Centers on West Campus of the IPCH, uh, Institute for Preservation of Cultural Heritage and the research scientists there, conservation um, staff for the various museums. It's this kind of package that you've got so many people you can turn to to ask questions and to work together uh, to sort of move some of this project forward. So I'm happy to answer questions. This, I just want to sort of tempt you in terms of what's possible. start off. So uh, when we were talking about the digital humanities, the question of sort of the skills, the coding skills and whatnot that um, are needed are not sort of part of this, the curriculum that we understand. Are there ways in which you could see this sort of work being incorporated in the curriculum or how you've managed to? Yeah, I mean, what I've managed to do, the question is um, how to integrate this into the curriculum. And that's why I wanted to actually show what I've been doing in some of the classes. Um, so with the undergraduates, I haven't necessarily other than the furniture class, I haven't taught them in class time itself, but I developed these kits last year when people were remote um, that I actually had them pick up or mail to them if they were truly off campus. Um, and they would make things, photograph them, and then ship the kit. Well, the weaving kit was inexpensive, so that was just a throwaway. But the, um, the ceramic kit and the metal kit ended up investing 25 to $35 for each of those kits. Um, so that's a way in which I felt like that became an assignment, you know, making and reflecting and really giving them parameters in which they could succeed. Um, and they had to write reflections, as I said. So they're, they're, it's not just simply winging it and then, you know, that's the end of it. But by reflecting and giving them, prompting them with certain questions was a way to dig deeper um, into what this meant in terms of the course. For the graduate students, um, I do it within class because you've got a longer period of time. Um, and, and I will try to develop, say, three or four making exercises over the semester. Um, so this course I'm teaching now on embodied knowledge, we did woodworking first. And the emphasis there was on the materials. What does the mater what, what's the agency of the material? Because it's green wood. And it's, uh, it's going to go the way it wants to go. Um, so you have to work with it. And then when we did metal, um, it was about um, thinking about the body, because I had them working at a bench, on the ground, sitting, all sorts, of, just kept moving their body positions around to get them finding what's the right way. And again, they had to write reflections. And then we just did pottery on, um, on Wednesday, and there I was trying to get them to focus on the hand. And again, having them on the ground, at, at a wheel, coiling, um, all sorts of different movements. So there's a way to do it to incorporate it. And then there's also like the undergraduates have this opportunity in the residential colleges that there are a number of different studios, like five pottery studios. There's a weaving studio in Morrison Styles, um, but it's harder for the graduate students to gain access to that. But it's not, you know, I'm not running an art school course either. Um, so, you know, it's that fine line um, it's got to tie into the theme, the reading, the intellectual content uh, of the course. Yeah, back. I have, there was, there have been a couple times that uh, I had the opportunity to have um, a teach-in um, on West Campus um, that was designed for graduate students, faculty, and museum people. Um, and I had different themes and brought different people in to run different sorts of projects. So one was on this idea of, um, Spoons, I mean, we sort of have a, a session in which we had uh, makers, artists talk about their practice, 
sort of one day, a second day would be making things on West Campus, and the third day would be about um, exhibition practice. Um, so there was one year we did one uh, that had sort of uh, the idea of reproducibility, that we had spoons. Uh, we cast spoons, we carved spoons, we made clay spoons, we hammered copper spoons, and just kept rotating people around, always working with the same spoon, and yet also had Andres Garces, who was working um, in conservation at that point, um, he had scanned one of these spoons, and then um, we did 3D printing um, as well as CNC uh, subtractive technology in wood and started working off of what's the difference between a, a cast pewter spoon and a CNC cutout spoon or a uh, 3D printed spoon. Um, and it was great conversations just to sort of explode that. There was another year we talked about um, the idea of, uh, of repair um, and um, in, in, in different kinds of uh, sort of recalibration that we had. Um, Christina Kim, who's a textile artist, come in and talk about uh, in a sewing circle. Um, we had Sam Thomas, uh, a Haudenosaunee beater, who came in and um, led a beating exercise to talk about reconciliation that he's been doing with uh, the Canadian boarding schools, uh, indigenous people. Um, and it was just incredible to think about reconciliation, repair, um, and how making and materials really lend themselves to this easygoing conversation. So that's, that's been one thing. Um, it's hard to do it every year, um, sort of just coming up with these ideas, trying to mobilize people. I think in terms of stories, um, anecdotes of, um, it's, I mean, what, what I've really been struck by with a graduate uh, seminar then when we're working with different materials, watching people all of a sudden just relax um, and start to realize I don't have to be a perfectionist. I'm just, I'm going with the flow, the idea of flow. And, you know, one of the topics that's come up this year is what does focus mean? What is concentration? What is absorption? Um, and how can you be focused in an area where you're all hammering and all of a sudden like that that white noise starts to become a way that you create your own little bubble versus being outdoors on a beautiful fall day and you're just using a simple little sloyd knife doing your final cuts on a spatula and you're just, you know, you're completely removed from the world. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to just sort of watching people's bodies relax, watching when they're social with one another, when they're sort of looking uh, at their own work, and you start to see that how it affects the way in which they're talking about objects uh, in subsequent classes. I don't know if that answers some of your question. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you, Professor Cook. Yep.